Chapter 15 of Jetta of the Lowlands by Ray Cummings. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In the Bandit Camp. The dark cave with its small spots of tube light mounted upon movable tripods was eerie with grotesque swaying shadows. The Bandit Camp. Hidden down here in the depths of the mid Atlantic lowlands, an inaccessible retreat this cave in which once was the ocean floor. Only a few years ago water had been here, water black and cold and soundless. Tremendous pressure, with three thousand or more phantoms of the ocean above it. Fishes had roamed these passages, no doubt. Strange monsters of the deeps, sightless, or with eyes like phosphorescent torches. But the water was gone now. Blue ooze was caked upon the cave floor. Eroded walls, niches and tiny gullies, crevices, and an arching dome high overhead. A fantastic cave. No one, seeing it as I saw it that morning, at dawn, could have believed it was upon this earth. From where De Beer had put me, on the flat top of a small butte-like dome, near the upper end of the sloping cave floor, all the area of this strange bandit camp was visible to me. A little tent of parchment was set upon the dome top. Yours, said the beer with a grin, make yourself comfortable. Gutierrez will be your willing servant until we see about this ransom. It will have to be one very large, for you are a damn trouble to me, Grant, and a risk. Food will come shortly. Then you can sleep. I think you will want it. He leaped from the little butte, leaving the taciturn, ever-watchful Gutierrez sitting cross-legged on the ledge near me, with his projector across his knees. The cave was irregularly circular, with perhaps a hundred feet diameter and a ceiling fifty feet high. A drift of the fetid lowland air went through it, into a rift at this upper end, and out through the lower passage entrance which sloped downward thirty feet and debouched upon a rippled ramp of ooze outside. It was daylight out there now. From my perch I could see the sullen, heavy walls of a ridge. Mist hung against them, but the early morning sunlight came down in shafts, penetrating the mist and striking the oily surface of a spread of water left here in the depth of the cauldron. De Beer's flyer was outside. We had landed by the shore of the sea, and the bandits had pushed the vehicle into an arching recess, which seemed as though made to hide it. All this camp was hidden. Arching crags of the ridge wall jutted out over the cave entrance. From above, any passing flyer, even though well below the zero height, would see nothing but this black, breathing sea lapping up against its eroded, fantastic shoreline. Within the cave there was only a vague filtering daylight from the lower entrance, a thin shaft from the rift overhead, and the blue tube light throwing great shadows of the tents and the men against the black rock walls. There seemed perhaps a hundred of the bandits here, a semi-permanent camp by its aspect. Gray parchment tents were set up about the floor, some small, others more elaborate. It seems as though it were a huddled little group of buildings in the open air, instead of in a cave. One tent, just at the foot of my dome, seemed the beer's personal room. He went into it after leaving me, and came out to join the main group of his fellows near the center of the cave where a large electron stove and piped water from a nearby subterranean freshet and a long table set with glassware and silver stood these men for kitchen and eating place. The treasure had not yet been brought in from the flyer, but from what I overheard, it seemed that the radiumized ingots of the ill-fated spawn and perona were to be stored for a year at least here in this cave. I could see the strong room cubby. It was hewn from the rock of the cave wall, 
its sealed grid door oval set with metal bars. I saw also what seemed a small but well-equipped machine shop in a recessed room at one side of the cave. Men were working in there under the light of tubes, and there was a niche hollowed out in the wall to make a room for De Beers' instruments, ether wave receivers and transmitters, the aerial receiving wires of which stretched in banks along the low ceiling. There was no activity in there now, except for one man who was operating what I imagine might be an aerial insulator, guarding the place from any prying search vibrations. The main cave was a bustle of activity. The arriving bandits were greeting their fellows and exchanging news. The men who had been left here were jubilant at the success of the chief's latest enterprise. Bottles were unsealed, and they began to prepare the morning meal. My presence caused considerable comment. I was a complication at which most of the men were ill-pleased, especially when the arriving bandits told who I was, and that the patrols of the United States were doubtless, even now, trying to find me. De Beer silenced the grumbling with rough words. My business not yours, but you will take your share of his ransom, won't you? Have done. And Jetta, she had caused comment also. But when the bottles were well distributed, the grumbling turned to ribald banter, which made me shudder that it should fall upon Jetta's ears. De Beer had kept his men away from her, shoving them aside when they crowded to see her. She was in a little tent now, not far from the base of my ledge. My meal was presently brought from where most of the bandits now were roistering at the long table in the center of the cave. Eat, said Gutierrez. I eat with you, Americano. Madre mia, when you are ransomed away from here, it will please me. De Beer is a fool with taking such a chance. With the meal ended, another guard came to take Gutierrez's place, and I was ordered into my tent. The routine of the camp, it seemed, was to use the daylight hours for the time of sleep. There were lookouts and guards at the entrance, and the little arsenal of ready weapons stocked in the passage. The men at the table were still at their meal. It would end, I did not doubt, by most of them falling into heavy alcoholic slumber. I was tired, poisoned by the need of sleep. I lay on fabric cushions piled in one corner of my tent, but sleep would not come. My thoughts ran like a tumbling mountain torrent, and as aimlessly. I hoped that Jetta was sleeping. De Beer was now at the center table with his men. Hans was guarding Jetta. He was a phlegmatic, heavy Dutchman, and seemed decent enough. I wondered what Hanley might be doing to rescue me, but as I thought about it, I could only hope that his patrols would not find us out here. An attack, and most certainly De Beer and his men, in their anger, would kill me out of hand, and possibly Jetta also. I had not had a word alone with Jetta since that scene in the control room. When we disembarked, she had stayed close by De Beer but I knew that Jetta had phantomed my purpose, that she was working to the same end. We must find a way of arranging the ransom which would give us an opportunity to escape. I pondered it, and at last an idea came to me, vague in all its details as yet, but it seemed feasible, and I thought it would sound plausible to De Beer. I would watch my chance and explain it to him. Then I realized how much aid Jetta would be. She would agree with my plan and help me convince him. And when the crucial time came, though I would be a captive, watched by Gutierrez, bound and gagged, perhaps, Jetta would be at liberty. De Beer and Gutierrez would not be on their guard with her. I drifted off to sleep, working out the details of my plan. End of Chapter 15